So our setup, as we should be getting used to, is I recommend you get a copy of either your work from last time or my code from last time. You make a copy of it and you put today's date to work on the new version. So in the network folder, you'll see the folder from last week, 622. You can either continue with your work or copy mine, 622. And I'm going to copy it to my flash drive, and I'll put today's date on it. For a couple of people, it happened that you might not have noticed which file you were working with or which folder. So keep track of that. But the way I work, that has worked for me and for previous classes, is you get a copy of last week's work, and then you rename it to this week or this day. That way you have a copy of the old code plus the new code. So once you've copied that over, in Notepad, you want to open the, um, the index file, but more specifically index.js. Go ahead and open index.js in the project, and then we'll get started. I'm also passing out this, uh, there's only one of them, this other sign-in right here, this other roster sign-in, because I've got to keep track of this attendance stuff, so make sure you also print your initials on this other one. one other. All right, let's open that index.js file. I'm going to open the index.html file also just to remind myself what the project looks like so far. I'll run the index file. I'm going to probably be running things in Chrome from now on. I like Firefox, but I like Chrome. It's debug features a little bit more. We don't have the latest version of Firefox, which has better mobile profiles and local storage viewing capabilities. But Chrome does, so I, I recommend you run your projects in Chrome so that you can uh, press F12 for the developer's console and then open the device emulator. So remember, you can click in the developer's console. You can turn on this, the toggle device toolbar. And then I would recommend you change it to something like iPhone or Nexus or whatever. Nexus 5 looks cool because it also looks like the device with buttons and such. Any one of those. So all that the project does, as soon as you load it up, it says ready to rock. We've got a login button, sign up button. Click sign up. The data, the users that we created previously, uh, they don't exist because they do get erased when we restart our computers. But now any users that we save at this point, they will be saved. So I'll just save something. Click go. We get the pop-up of success. Some feedback in the console. So we have the ability to create a user. We're gonna, the first thing we'll do is start to change this a little bit. At the moment, you get a success pop-up. What you have to do then is you click outside of it to close it, and then you click back, and then you sign in. It's going to be better that the person creates the account, and as soon as they create the account, why not let them sign in? So when you click go and it tells you thank you for registering, why not then go to be able to go directly to log in? We have to close the success dialog, go back to the welcome, then go forward to log in. So let's change this first. This success pop-up, which is in the HTML file. 
open index HTML. We have a very simple success on line 43. This pop-up can be upgraded a little bit nicer for it to say the message of success, but also with a button to take us to the login screen. I'm going to change this dialogue, uh, this this pop up a little bit. Let's first break the break the div because we're going to add more details. So on line 43, I'm just going to break that. It's going to be more stuff than just this. I want to add a couple more attributes. Okay, so we've got data roll pop-up. Then I want to add data dash dialog equals true. This will give me a variation, a slightly different version of the plain old pop-up. This is going to behave a li little bit more like a dialog box. Slightly different than a pop-up. Another attribute data dismissible equals false. At the moment, you can click anywhere outside of a pop-up to dismiss it. I just click outside of where it says success and it goes away. I want that you cannot close it by clicking outside. That way I don't lose people's focus. People do stuff quickly and not pay too much attention and whoops, what did I just close? So by setting it to data dismissible false, you won't be able to they won't be able to close it unless they literally click the close button. Then this message of success, I want to put it inside of a header. So we'll add the header. Open close header. This is going to be a dialog box with a little header, a main content area. Header needs data roll header, like we've always done. Like we've always done, we've also added an H1. So I'm taking a plain old pop-up in the index.html file and making it an interesting, more more of an interesting dialog box. Data roll dialog or data dialog true, not dismissible header. Well, if we've got a header, we then need an article. With the usual role of main and the UI content as a class. This will be a plain paragraph. The pop-up will have the heading of success. There will be text that says some message like thanks, ready to go, break, because then on the next line will be a button to log in. say log in. It's going to be a button to log in. We've seen that already. A tag, data roll button, etc. So a tag, a tag around this button, href, come back to this in a moment, then uh, data roll button
data transition, flip. They'll click the button to go somewhere. There will be a flip animation. All right, so where should the somewhere be? Where should this go to? The login page. What's our ID for the login page? It's right here. Section ID PG login. So we want to go, when the person clicks that button, to go to the screen. Pound sign PG login. Remember that pound sign designates an ID. This is a very common mistake for people. They forget to add the pound sign. There's no pound sign here, but the pound sign means ID. So go ahead and save it and run it. Create a new user. The difference is now instead of a, just a simple pop-up that says success, it should be a little bit more interesting looking. It has the it should have the ability of non-dismissible. There'll be a button to go to the login screen and then we'll start to code the whole login system. We created a sign up system and then we'll be creating a login system. You said if you click off of it, it shouldn't let you dismiss it. Exactly. Is, is it closing? It is. Let's double check our spelling data dismissible. Sorry, it's I misspelled it. It's dismissible, not able. Dismissible. Dismissable. We both sound correct, but it's with an I. Let me confirm mine works. So if I refresh that, sign up, I'll create a new user. pop up success thanks ready to go uh, it was one little thing to fix uh, we're getting too much of this extra border that's you might like it but if you don't want that extra border there that's because we also have that uh, what else we have that extra oh that extra class that we don't really need uh, UI content we've got class UI content for the for the start of the dialog box which we don't need there because we've got it down here so since we've got it for the article and the pop-up, the div, it's the better double and it kind of looks odd. I'm going to remove it, but if you like how it looks, you can, you can take it away. I think it's too much of an extra border around the edge of that dialog. See that? There's too much there, I think. You can remove it by removing that extra class, UI content. see the difference. Now the uh, header goes all the way to the edge. So this can be whatever message you want, whatever you want it to say. Then we've got the button of login. If I try to click outside, it should not be dismissible. That's what I want. I don't want people to lose focus here. You can easily, people can click too fast. The box goes away and they'll say, what did, what did that say? What did I just click on? So by making it dismissible false, nothing happens until you click an actual valid button. Click login, and it's ready for the login screen. So that's what we've done so far. On the index page, line 43, we changed our pop-up a little bit. So now we need to work on setting up our HTML files login screen. That'll then, that won't be too complex because we're just asking for their, their name and their password. Well, the complex part will be the JavaScript, the JavaScript to check does that user exist? Does the password match? No? Okay, tell them. Yes? Okay, take them to the next screen. 
to this login screen. Just a message top, bottom, login. We see that on line uh, 59. There's our login screen. Top, bottom, login. At the top, we'll write the name of the app again. Uh, CMDB. This bottom at the moment, uh, it'll be static, but later on it'll be set to be dynamic. It'll say the person's name after they've, log after they've logged in. We will be able to, to give people at a glance to let them know who has logged in. Because if we've got a login system, we'll have a logout system. We'll have a, an ability for multiple people to log in and have their own version of the app, their own data. So for the moment, we'll just maybe just write a copyright notice. And then later on, this will change dynamically via the JavaScript when it detects who logs in. Copyright, copyright symbol 2017. Yes. <clears throat> Sometimes when you uh, the website wants to the username and password, mm -hmm. sometimes it gives you time. Mm -hmm. A you time limit. Two minutes. Yes. To enter your password. If you couldn't get in, it's going to be dismissed. Yes, that's a very secure system there. Um, time limit to log in. And a predetermined number of false attempts. Yeah. Definitely, those are those are good ways to make it even more. Far away from this book. Not too far. I didn't plan on doing that, but uh, we might look it up to see how to do it, and that could be something to be added. But it is extra extra coding, uh, definitely. What you teach us is already somebody are in the site. How is doing uh, first time? No, right right now it's set that this is the first time. Right. We've programmed it so far that it doesn't know who you are. Once we've worked a little bit more, then it will detect that you have logged in, and next time you come back, you will already be logged in. So we will do that. And on some banks and some social sites, on your cell phone, usually they uh, copy and store your user. Mm -hmm. Just you should put your password. Yeah, there's many more ways where we can make this more more secure, definitely, which require more coding. But that those are good points to think about to make the app even more secure. And uh, is it right that they would find our cell phone or our desktop, the ID of the instrument that we use, they store the information next time? Is familiar with them? Hmm, I don't get it. Say 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 that again. I said. If I use my cell phone, uh -huh. if I want to go to Bank of America, mm -hmm. they know this cell phone. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, that is something that we can do once we get to part two of the class. We will be able to detect various features of the device. And every device has a unique identifier, which we can check what it is, so that we can read and store that information or use it for some reason. So we'll look at that in part two next, next week. So let's set up our system here to be able to log in. Uh, the log in is going to be very much like the sign up. We need a form where someone puts in their name and their password. Then the JavaScript takes over. So we'll start a form. We'll give that an ID so that we can refer to it. Form log in. So via JavaScript, we will be able to tell which form because we've got two so far. And we'll probably have more later. So again, the ID uh, differentiates them. Very similar to before, we need a label and then an input field. So in the form, we'll set up a label. We'll set up an input. Label is the visible text, so all we're, all we're going to do is ask for password, username and password. So label for in email login 
The other one was called in email sign up, but it's still asking for email. Our input is of type email. It will only accept email addresses. I'm going to put mine on the line below it just so that you can see it. I'll keep it on the same line. Um, we'll say required. Previously we did required equals required, right? Simply required should also work. Placeholder. Some email placeholder. This needs a name and an ID, same name as the four attribute, same ID as the four attribute. I'm going to copy and paste these two. If they're complete, I'm going to copy and paste one below. And then ask and set up password. I don't need a confirm password. I only just need one password. I need a confirm password box under sign up, but not log in. I'm going to save some effort by copying and pasting the same thing, which needs some changes. It'll ask for password. This will be in password login for the for the four and the name and the ID. Very careful here. Copy and pasting is helpful, but remember to change every detail or else this won't quite work. Things having the same login or the same name or the same ID will probably cause problems in the JavaScript. I do not need a placeholder for the password. It's not type of email anymore. It's type of what? What kind of data are we accepting? We have password. Input type password. And then we need a submit button. This one you can copy and paste from the sign up or just add it to input type submit. Value, what's the text that appears on the button? We'll say go and then an ID. This will be BTN login. This is our log this is our button for logging in. In the sign-up screen, we had some possible feedback. Your passwords don't match. The account exists. So we need some pop-up divs, like we had pop-up divs for <coughs> sign-up. So still inside of this article, but after the form, create a div. data role pop-up, class, so it's got a simple background, UI content, ID, so we can refer to it, pop login non-existent. Maybe, maybe we can think of a shorter word, but this is going to be the pop-up that will pop up if, that, if you're trying to log an account with an account that doesn't exist and the accounts are based on the email. So here's a pop-up for login, non-existent. We'll say account 
doesn't exist. That'll be the text that is visible to the user. I'm going to copy and paste that because another possibility of an error or a pop-up would be uh, that the password doesn't match. So this will check what, did, what username are you using, what are they, password are they trying to type, that password doesn't match what we've stored. So a new pop-up that says incorrect password. So I'm copying the same thing. Message, one password. ID is pop log in incorrect. So we won't be able to trigger these pop-ups yet until we write the JavaScript. And let's assume those are the errors. The success results are that you go to the home screen, the home screen where now you can start using the app. Remember, our app concept is an inventory system. Well, assuming that they logged in with the proper email, proper password, it should go to a home screen. We don't have a home screen yet. We've created the welcome screen, sign up screen, login screen, we need a home screen. Based on the template that we have, starting on line 82 or so, this is our template to create a section or a screen. I'm going to copy the template and paste it right after the login screen. Technically the order of these screens doesn't matter because we will be able to jump, the user will be able to jump from screen to screen as necessary, but conceptually I'm going to keep template as the last item. The next item is, it's not template page start anymore, it's home page start. This will be the home screen, the home section of the app. Therefore, the ID is PG home. Top bottom, we'll deal with that in a moment, but at least I'll say home screen, just so that I see something when I actually go to this screen. We'll fill in the details, of course. What I've done here is I've copied the template, pasted it, changed it a little bit. The most important thing is a new ID. So we can't get to this home page yet. We need to write a lot of JavaScript for it to um, find your password and all of that, and then it'll take us to the home screen. So we won't be able to see this home screen for a little while, but we've got this home screen set up. Make sure it's PG Home ID. If you run your code up to this point, All that you really should see is login. You don't have to create any more accounts. I have a few accounts already set up. Remember, you can see under uh, application, local storage file. These are the accounts I've got set up so far. So <coughs> these are the accounts I have so far. Whoops, you can see my password, so don't, don't memorize it. Uh, I'm going to uh, refresh the project. Uh, I don't need to create more signups. They're ready for me in my case. You can just go start going directly to log in. Log in will have the email and the password. This this will not work yet. Even if I try to put in the right info, it's not set up yet. Error loading page. So then we'll pro we'll do the processing via JavaScript.
All right, so that's what we've got so far. Uh, any questions at this point? We're going to do some extensive JavaScript now to make the login work, but before that, does everyone have the, the screens looking something like this? Okay, so to make this work, we will create a function that has all of the steps to look at what someone typed in the email box. What did they type in the password box? Check if the email exists in local storage. If it does, then check the password. So a function to do a bunch of things. Very similar to what we did in the sign up. We had a function to take this information and do something with it. Well, before that, we needed to create a JavaScript variable, an object, which was a representation of the form. Then we needed to create a JavaScript object or variable for the button so that on the event of a click, we then run the function. So we need to do the same thing. We need to set up JavaScript objects, event handlers, and then a function for this login screen to work. Save your index file and jump over to the index.js file. So in the index.js file, we've got a function that does all the processing, but we don't get to that function until a person clicks submit, then we run the function. But we can't submit until we've defined an element for the form in JavaScript. So we're going to do the same thing first. At about line 62, first we'll create the jQuery element, then we'll set up the submit event handler, then we'll create the function to run after clicking. I've already got line uh, 62 in the in the JavaScript. I've already got a uh, one variable. Next line, create another variable. Uh, this one's on sixty-four. Next, we'll set up a variable dollar l form log in. The dollar shows that we're about to create a jQuery based variable. We will use the jQuery selector to find the ID of the other form. So dollars quote uh, dollars parenthesis semicolon the jQuery selector quotes pound the the ID of the form we just created form log in so now we've created a jQuery element or object so that we can uh, reference it in JavaScript. We're going to reference it the same way we reference the sign up. So new line, line 68, dollar l form login dot submit. Dollar l form login dot submit. We've got the object of l form login and the method of submit, just like before. And like before, we're going to write the same sort of thing here. Let's run a function on the event of something. Run a function, pass the event in. So be mindful of your parentheses here. This is why I close parentheses and curly braces, because you can lose track. If I started to write at this point, function, blah, 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 and then I closed my function, that might be closing my function, not my submit. closing the submit method, then starting function, open close parentheses, open close curly brace. So it would have been very easy to accidentally close it function thinking that that was the close of submit or vice versa. We are going to call a function on an, on a, on an event, the event, the event of submit. 
We're then going to run or invoke function login, which doesn't exist yet. It has its own opening and close parentheses because of the syntax. And in these parentheses, we also pass into it the event, the event object. We do a submit. This passes data into this function. That data is in the event. This then further gets passed into the function, which we can use when we define the function. All right, so because I've written a note right here, this, per this curly brace ends my function sign up, line 56. So I'm going to give myself a new line there to start to define function login. Function keyword to define function login. Open close parentheses, curly brace. I'll make a note that that's end of function sign up or login. like before how we were setting up a function, function sign up, event, we're going to pass in an event and then prevent default. Doing this prevent default um, prevent default deactivates the default behavior of submitting a form. That's why we get an error in the console when we try to submit a form. It says something about cross origin request. Uh, you also get a pop-up that says error well, we're preventing the default because we're redefining what will happen when you submit. Normally, a submit button was used to pass data over to a server. We're not dealing with a server. We're all dealing with it internally in our app. So we're de uh, overriding the default action. We're no longer connecting with a server. We're staying in our app, so we're doing prevent default. I had a console log of start the function, so we'll do that again. Console.log. Start fn log in. Just a little feedback for ourselves to see where the function starts, where it ends in the console. So we need to create some variables to see what people typed into those boxes. What was the username that they typed and what was the password? So we'll create some variables. L in email login. And that is based on the in email login ID comma, because I also want to get L in uh, password login. Based on pound in uh, password login. So previously I said the person is going to sign in, is going to sign up and a person may use uppercase or lowercase letters or the password. And the problem with that is they might have signed up with a capital V Victor at victor.com. They put a capital V. 
and then they're going to sign in next time and they forgot they put a capital V and they put a lowercase v. And they said, what's wrong with this dumb app? It doesn't let me sign in. I know I've created the account. So we're going to force the email and the password that they've typed in to uppercase. Whatever they type, we'll force it to uppercase because that's what we stored with the sign up function. Whatever they typed, we forced it to uppercase and stored it in our local storage. So one more item here, comma. I'm doing commas because I'm still creating variables. Once I'm finished creating variables, I will end the line at semicolon. Be careful there. I noticed a few people when I, when I helped you last time, you either forgot to put something at the end of the line or you ended the line too soon. I'm putting a comma there because I'm still creating variables. Like we did last time. Temp val in email login. Temporarily, uh, let's see what the email is, convert it to uppercase, and store it. And say l in email login dot val gives me the value that was typed into that element in email login, and then dot to uppercase capital U, capital C, comma. We've done this before. Whatever email, give me the value, uppercase it, store it. We'll do the same thing for password. Temp val in password log in. in password login dot val method dot to uppercase method and then semicolon. That semicolon ends my usage of creating variables. For debugging, I want to display in the console what has been typed so that I'm not trying to figure this out blindly in case I do errors. I want to see, am I capturing the name? Am I capturing something in those boxes? Are they becoming uppercase? So next line in the console, I'm going to say email is plus temp val in email login comma password is plus temp val in password log in so after typing something into those boxes and clicking go the console should then say that the email is that I've typed in whatever that is turned to uppercase, and also what the password is, turned to uppercase. This is a way for us to start to test it as we set up our functionality. Where did the sign-in roster go? The one with the, uh, the initials. Did everyone get that sign-in roster? All right, so if you want to do a little test here to see how it looks like so far. Let's see, so I'm going to refresh. I'm going to go directly to login. Go. Console says I'm starting my login function. I typed in something and it became uppercase 
email, password, that's it there so far. So this is getting us uh, started. It does see what we typed into the boxes. And um, it's going to, then we're going to check it and everything. So if it works up to this point, great. Uh, let's take our first break. If it doesn't quite work, uh, check, check with me and then we'll go on. So at 6.50, we'll take a break until 7, and then we'll make this fully work.